A series of threats against school leaders in the metro area, anger over vaccinations, masks, and Black Lives Matter events. A new library serving Denver has a purpose beyond books. I hope that it goes beyond like just the basic library needs. Amachi is on its way to becoming a national historic site. We look into the benefits that come with that designation. Keeping score during the Olympics can be tough, especially when it seems like those scores are so subjective. Marshall gives us a lesson in judging. And we'll celebrate delicious victory together in your at-home Olympics, because this is next, but before. Threats against schools from Coloradans angry about masks, vaccines, and Black Lives Matter. There have been three in recent weeks. Most recently, police determined the threat that moved a Cherry Creek School Board meeting into secure mode yesterday was not credible. A man had made multiple references online to district meetings using bomb and explosion emojis and the word ignition. Steve Sager has been looking into the string of threats to school leaders around the metro area. Kyle, the Greenwood Village Police Department told me they interviewed the guy who posted that threat, the perceived threat that was sent to them through Safe to Tell. It appears it was just a pretty liberal use of the bomb emoji. Police have confirmed it was a post from Don LeConte on Facebook that they were looking into. LeConte uses bomb emojis in responses to conservative critics of the Cherry Creek School Board on social media and posts about teachers unions, Black Lives Matter and remote learning. It was a post where LeConte posted that same bomb emoji asking for directions to a meeting that got reported to police and then move that meeting online. Greenwood Village Police said that they found no connection to a bomb threat against Jefferson County School Board that also moved a meeting remote. School boards and administrations or administrators have been facing a number of threats lately. We learned today that a man was ticketed by Littleton Police for leaving a voicemail for the Littleton School Superintendent threatening to inject him with a syringe of anthrax. According to a police report, that man is described as a very conservative anti-vaxxer who follows QAnon. Police psychologist John Nicoletti told me even though many of the threats may not be credible, school administrators still have to act. There is damages to giving in, but there's also damages to not giving in and having what we call a false negative, where you think, oh, it's just somebody saying that and then something bad happens. So you got to live with either direction. Now, Nicoletti says when threats provoke action, like canceling a meeting or moving it to virtual, it actually does give copycats courage to try it again. But he says school security officers are making the right call by doing something, Kyle, to try to prevent an inevitable something from happening. Even if the threat doesn't seem credible, it's probably best move to just kind of move things and do things virtual. Well, because as you have reported, Steve, sometimes these threats do become physically manifested, like that situation with the elementary school in Northwest Denver, where a guy angry about what he had seen on Fox News showed up at the building and got inside. Angry about critical race theory, the man went inside the school, said that he was a parent trying to register his kids. He went inside. He was told to leave. He ended up protesting on the outside. Uh, but that was enough for the district to send a letter home to parents, just kind of letting him know what happened. Steve Staker, thank you. Up in Thornton, City Council has just more than 20 days to figure out who they would like to work with because they're throwing off one of their colleagues. City Council voted 5-4 last week to create a vacancy in Ward 1. It was the seat occupied by Jackie Phillips. Now, City Council races are nonpartisan Colorado, but in Thornton, like many places, you know exactly where everyone stands. There's a 5-4 to four board right now. Phillips was one of the liberal minority members. The conservative members decided that she no longer lives in Thornton because she's splitting her time between there and a second home in Alamosa. And with the majority, they'll get to pick a replacement, too. We'll talk about this tonight and set a timeline, but the deadline's moving fast. Applications have to be in a week from today, and they'll swear in their new colleague March 8th. So we have our Democratic front runner for governor of Colorado. It's, it's the governor of Colorado. Jared Polis officially launched his re-election campaign today. He's kicking things off with a four-day tour of the state starting tomorrow in Pueblo. There will be a Republican primary front runner, and that is CU Regent Heidi Ganahl. There's no question that we are easing out of the big Omicron wave of COVID-19. And if the numbers continue to hold, our positivity rate will finally be under 5% by the end of the week. Over the last seven days, 7.4% of tests done in the state have come back positive. This time last week, it was over 10%. Two weeks ago, over 15%. Again, we'd love to be back under 5%. That's where public health experts consider the virus to be largely under control. 
Olympic scoring in a lot of sports is so dense, it's so opaque. Take like figure skating. NBC will put a scoreboard up in the corner of the screen, all these details on what's going on, and then they'll pay a bunch of commentators to explain it to you as the numbers are totaling. Because how else can we tell the difference between goodness and greatness? There's Marshall Zellinger. Uh, Jenna, you want to do your double axel? You don't have to be a figure skater like Jenna Cope. They're not looking necessarily at the speed. They're watching to make sure that she does the correct number of rotations. To know if you're watching a metal-worthy figure skating routine. I really like to watch whether their feet go to the music. Jerry Lane. Ideally, you want the heel of the blade facing the exit of the landing. The skating director at South Suburban Parks and Rec. That was a little noisy. Then the judges listened for that. He's helping us learn how to understand the score. One of the problems that we're struggling with with this system is when an audience looks at it, uh, a score that comes up, they don't know if that's good or bad. That's where skaters like Jenna, oh, that was good effort, and Hayden Heitman come in. But you're looking for a good arch. I always tell the skaters, think of like a banana, making a banana out of your body. Figure skating gets judged in two sections. The score you see on the screen is how well they execute the elements. Good core change in the sit. The elements have a base score, and depending on how well they execute it, judges can increase that score up to five more points or take away up to five points. They're looking at the correctness of the takeoff, the edge on the takeoff. They're looking for the landing to see if the jump is fully rotated. Their job is not to say that was a good one or a bad one. The second score, the one you don't see added up during the performance, is based on multiple criteria judged on a scale of zero to 10, like how well they skate and transition from one element to the next. It shouldn't be skate, 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 jump. Skate, 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 jump. It's a fabric that, that has to be woven. They're also judged on the performance. When they are in the air, did they have good air positions with their legs? Did they have classical looking camel positions or nice sits positions? And the time skating between jumps is not just time skating between jumps. So you're looking here for difficult turns. You're looking for difficult steps. And if you still feel like it's too much to follow, staying upright is good. My mother, God bless her, I, she didn't know anything about skating, but she knew if I was horizontal or vertical, and vertical is good. Here is a sample box score from Nathan Chen's short program from last week. The far left shows abbreviations for the elements, the jumps and spins. The base value is what you get for being okay. The nine judges then give you anywhere from a minus five to a plus five based on how you did on that element. The top and bottom scores are thrown out. The rest are averaged and added or subtracted from the base value. That's the score you see during the performance. The program components are the different criteria you must show during the skate. Those are judged on a scale of zero to ten. Again, top and bottom are thrown out and they're averaged. Add the element scores to the program component scores and you have the total. And Kyle, if you have a serious error in your performance, yeah. you cannot do greater than plus two in the technical part, and you can't get a perfect 10 in the, in the program component part. So there's that, that built-in protection against funny business. Yeah, but you get that, basic, that base score just for showing up. So, so you or I could go out there and just weeble wobble out there and we would get that score? If you do it, just if you just do it and you land it, okay. But if you're going to fall over, or if you're going to weeble it. or wobble, you're yeah. getting the minus five, and yeah. you're not getting anything. All of this complexity is set up so that what uh, the the French judge can't screw the Canadian team again. Is that why? This, yes, we've come okay. a long way from when it used to be easy, zero to six point oh. Yeah, and this is so that yes, judges from certain countries can't do certain things to favor other people. Yeah, take that, Russia and France. Uh, all right, thank you, Marshall. Team Iceland does not have any ice skaters in the Olympics. Feels like a missed opportunity. Uh, so their hopes of winning their first ever Winter Olympic medal comes down to just one man remaining. Together we've been rooting for Iceland in addition to Team USA because we love an underdog story. And we love the sweet sound of the Icelandic national anthem, the Lofsjunkar. Here is the one man left standing for Iceland. Sterla Snare Snorsen competing in the men's slalom tonight. Airs at 7.15 right here on 9 News. Looks like anybody you'd bump into a bar in the high country of Colorado. Snorsen was the co-flag bearer for Iceland at the opening ceremony. He has Olympic experience. He competed in the slalom and the giant slalom in Pyeongchang in 2018. He did not finish either race.
So there's nowhere to go but up. If he lands on the podium, he will make history in a country that has a millennia of it. They'll write sagas about Snurla. Most recently in Icelandic, Icelandic history, 19 Winter Olympic appearances blanked on the medals. Sturla tonight, 7.15, 9 News. Amachi is close to becoming a National Historic Site. So what does that even mean for this chapter in Colorado history? Down there in Southeast Colorado, there is a treasure trove of um, culture and history that I think is not known as much. Mess with the mama bird, get the talents. Portions of Rocky Mountain National Park are closing to keep us from getting clawed. That's Nest. The Amachi site in Southeast Colorado has cleared its biggest hurdle yet to becoming a National Historic Site and joining the National Park Service system. So what does that mean for that land? The Amachi Atonement Site, also known as the Granada War Relocation Center, opened in Granada in 1942, closed in 45. That was the place where the U.S. government forcibly relocated more than 7,000 people of Japanese descent, including American citizens, placed them in Amachi for World War II. The Senate voted unanimous yesterday to send a bill declaring it a National Historic Site. National Parks Conservation Association talked to us today about what happens next. That means that the site will eventually be open to the public as managed by the National Park Service. And that means that visitors from across the country will be able to know the Amachi story, to learn from current descendants. Um, to preserve the stories of the survivors of Amachi. They'll be able to tour the barracks, um, ideally a visitor center in the future. In Congress, that bill goes back to the House for a final vote on an amendment. Should be safe there, passed the House originally 416 to 2. Once the bill's passed and signed by the President, the Park Service will get to work on a management plan for the site. That's when we'd learn more about if they intend to add buildings or other amenities to Amachi. Rocky Mountain National Park initiated raptor closures today, which is smart because even one velociraptor attack is too many. I'm mistaken. This is a bird story. So every year the park closes certain climbing areas to the public so that people can't disturb nesting birds of prey. Ah, there we go. Raptors like red-tailed hawks, Cooper's hawks, peregrine falcons, and golden eagles. Closures are during peak nesting times now to the end of July. Most of the closures are rock formations within the park. So Twin Owls, Batman Rock, the Parish, Bookmark Pinnacle, Cathedral Wall. And this is really for human safety more than anything else. I mean, the raptors are going to be fine, but good luck trying to climb a rock wall with a face full of angry beaks and talons tearing at you. Hard to believe a storm is coming with sunshine and temperatures near 60 degrees, but it's coming and the cold air will follow. Front comes in around 11 o'clock tonight. Snow develops north in the morning, doesn't move into metro until noon, and then the evening drive is going to be tough. Heavy snow falls between 5 p.m. and midnight. We're under a winter storm watch for four to eight inches of snow, but the system is a fast mover. It's out of here by Thursday. Some of the foothill areas could see five to 10 inches of snow. So, yes, the storm will be impactful. It moves out Thursday morning, a nice warming trend for the weekend. Another storm and chance for snow next Monday. I think we need 10 more of these libraries popping up all over Denver. Denver Public Library's newest branch is more than just a place to check out books. It's a workspace for a community low on resources and on high-speed Internet access. Bittersweet symphony news today. Only if you're a next reporter who had eyes on a second career. That's life. And some sweet at-home Olympic content. Your eyes don't glaze over first. Next. It's a library branch intended to double as a workspace for people in Denver's Five Points, Cole, Globeville, and El Rio Swansea neighborhoods. 
Today is our soft opening for our branch, um, so we're just opening our doors to the public. My name is Monica Lozano, and I am the senior librarian here at Art Park. So we have free Wi-Fi that extends into the park as well. We have free printing, copying, scanning. So as far as we know, it's the first arts-focused branch in the country. So this is the main gallery space. My name is Anthony Garcia, Sr. I'm the executive director of Birdsea Collective. I'm also a resident artist next door. So each space houses a separate artist. Yeah, this one is my space right here. Artists in general don't have much space to work uh, that's affordable. Um, so this is something that we're able to provide to those artists. I think one of the biggest thing is really getting connected with the community um, and kind of having us and our partners reflect the community. I think we need Ten more of these libraries popping up all over Denver. We've had multiple conversations about the digital divide and how the library space is hopefully breaking that digital divide. In this community and other communities in Denver, it's just been a huge need. Even just having it accessible to like walk down the street versus having to like take a bus or get in your car. We're a public library, so our, our job is to serve the community. We can come in with ideas of what we think the community is going to want, but ultimately the community is who tells us. Community decides, including a community vote coming up for the name of the new branch. Colorado Symphony has a new principal conductor, and we're sorry to tell you that Steve Steger was not even considered after years of not-so-subtle lobbying for that job. Peter Unjun has been appointed as the new principal conductor of the Colorado Symphony. He's been a frequent collaborator with the symphony and served as the orchestra's principal guest conductor from 2003 to 2006. He was also the music director for the Colorado Symphony Orchestra and the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. Some experience, perhaps, the reason why he, he beat out this guy for the job. I'm nervous as heck right now. <laughs> that was so much. Okay, if you are an OG Next fan, if you've been around since the beginning, you remember this. A beardless and young Steve Steger trying his hand at guest conducting in 2018. Reviews suggested that what Steve lacked in skill, he made up for with enthusiasm and perspiration. Unjun will be replacing Brett Mitchell, music director who left the symphony last summer. He'd been at the helm for five seasons. Coming up here, they are just like Olympic medals, but they're not because we don't want to get sued. Then your feedback next. Hey guys, next producer Kevin Larson once again. Anything can happen when you're hurtling down a mountain at 80 miles an hour. For more on the protective pants that are just as important to winter speed sport athletes as their helmets, watch the Olympic Zone with Tom Green at 5.30. So it turns out many of you are Olympics ready, you just simply have not gotten invited. That's why we have the segment called Colorado's At Home Olympics, but not the Olympics, because if we said Olympics, it would sue us. That is sweet. Are you kidding me? This is the backyard bobsled. Brant on the sled up in the mountains above Boulder. <laughs> or pardon me, Brant's the dad. Eight-year-old Mason is on the sled. Mason and dad win gold for that. That's wild. He's ripping along. Might I suggest edible medals if you could? Kaylin's niece Taylor had an Olympics-themed birthday party last week. These were the gold medals they handed out. I'll take three and two of the silver, please. I assume those were powdered. Uh, Marion writes in with some very helpful feedback tonight to say, I sure miss Tom and Kim on the 5 p.m. news. Please put them back on. Uh, I miss them, too. Uh, I also missed this show being on at 6. We slid everything up because of the Olympics. When the Olympics are over, Tom and Kim will be back here. I'll be back at 6 o'clock. Wendy says, please ask Kyle to do all of the newscasts in Icelandic. Nine. Which I think is Icelandic for no. If it's not, I'm going to have to do the shows in Icelandic. <laughs>